panelists, except we are now joined by Isabel Coffey, who is the CTO of Celestia. And uh, the moderator of this panel is Nima from Polychain. So Nima, take it away. And 
and there will be bugs, and there will be uh, problems and security vulnerabilities, and people will find them, and we will go through a, through a number of people through the things, and we shouldn't just expect that. So we should not rely on a single um, line of defense. We should be layering our defense with multiple other things. We should do a lot of stuff like um, bug bounties, and like automated bug bounties, where we deploy systems with uh, some honeycomb and let people crack it. Uh, and other things, like maybe insurance in the beginning to, like, to test things out before they uh, uh, end in full scale, uh, like before they become the alternative for the world's financial system. So like the, 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 the only way you can ensure that something is, is really secure is that if it's been in production for a long period of time and it's not been half, then the system can be considered secure. Billions of dollars in there for like one, two, three years, uh, then you can, you can probably trust it. But if you make a small change in the system, you can already introduce it. Like the, 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 this is a very interesting and intricate question of how you deal with the upgrades, for example. But uh, expect turbulence. And just like be ready for it. So don't put too much money in, in any of those systems in the beginning. I would like to add just a tiny uh, um, additional thing that is specific to how rollups uh, are deployed right now. It's like um, if you have like a centralized sequencer, or um, in, in both cases, like ZK rollups or optimistic rollups, it makes it easier, at least for short periods of time, maybe, it makes it easier to censor or like hold the network. And, um, so that's why I think it's also important that the uh, roll-up chains are actually like real P2P network and real chains and not having only one centralized sequencer. Yeah. Yeah. To, um, so like my, my broader philosophy on this is that I don't believe code is law on blockchains. And I believe that the purpose of blockchains is to function as a social coordination layer. So we talk about, so we talk a lot about layer one. But there's also a layer zero, which is social consensus. Like every time I do a hard, you know, a, a hard fork in Ethereum, you have to get social consensus from layer zero. And um, to agree on critical calls, you have to get social consensus from layer zero. And back in 2016, when there was this massive DAO hack on Ethereum, you have to go back to social consensus. And people and the Ethereum community agreed to hard fork, um, effectively, and reverse the hack. And I think that's perfectly fine. And one that, like, but it's not ideal if you create a smart contract in Ethereum. You cannot expect for the entire Ethereum ecosystem to hard fork just because your specific smart contract was hacked. But that's why I think with the with the model that we're trying to create at Celestia, where you have these app specific rollups, and um, you can hard fork, you can go back to the social consensus of that specific rollup and hard fork without affecting directly all the other rollups. And there's still the issue of how do you deal with the cross chain bridges between rollups and other rollups. But in the case of the mystic rollup, um, even though mystic rollups have a longer, let's like, say, one week withdrawal period, in some way that provides an advantage because it provides the ability um, for the social consensus to go back to the, the social consensus layer and have some time to um, do some actions to agree to change the rules. If I may add to this, uh, I agree on, on the issue of uh, layer zero and social consensus. This is indeed what blockchains are for. Uh, but it's also, it, it can be a dangerous road if we rely too much on social consensus, especially in, in the absence of uh, uh, stability mechanisms. Like if, 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 if the system is meta stable and doesn't have a stable state, and then you say, oh, it's going to remain stable because like, we know that we will always rely on social consensus in the end, this can be very dangerous. So I, I, I you know, like with, with the DAO situation, I think Ethereum would be much better off if the incident, if the precedent was not set with immutability and instead uh, we remained, for example, like there was the, uh, the soft fork which let white hat, uh, white hat hackers to, to, to like get money back, not all of it, but a significant portion. So Ethereum would be much better off without the fork and just going this path with, with the soft fork. In my, is my opinion. So like, we should preserve code as much as possible, uh, but of course, like with, with the final like the source of power is people, and uh, they they decide what the law is that. Yeah, sure. I mean, we don't disagree there. Um, I think the point is that um, just because we have this social consensus layer, the whole point of blockchains is to reduce the cost of social coordination, and that does 
and that is why you should make it, you show your protocol is um, is incentive compatible and crypto economy secure. Because the point is to reduce um, reduce the um, chances of having like, the social consensus there, rather than relying explicitly on social consensus there. Should we go back to it um, in the worst case, our unhappy path? Yeah, um, one, one last thing to uh, bring up before we switch it back to the internet or the roll is a tangent to this is how on-chain option guards happens. Do you have any specific thoughts on how that can be basically influenced by, let's say, the social consensus data? Uh, so that depends what you mean by on-chain governance. Like, if you mean like Tesla-style on-chain governance where and like 51% of the coins can change the rules of the protocol. Um, I think that's interesting, but that's not something I would advocate for myself because that effectively creates like a rule, like they're saying that the rules of the chain um, should be decided by whoever has the most capital. Whereas really like the point of blockchain for me is that um, the rules of the chain uh, like the, the point of watching for me is like that if if this one percent attack or or this other majority of validators in the chain uh, should not be able to change the rules of the chain, and that's why users need to independently validate the transactions of the chain um, to make sure that all transactions are valid. But like if 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 the because it's, because they have to trust the block producers, but if the block producers are allowed to change the rules of the chain. Um, it's not necessarily invalid, but it changes some of the key uh, values that I think are important in the blockchain. Um, which is, I don't advocate for that kind of style of on-chain governance. I would advocate for more, like, I think it's okay to have on-chain governance for, for indications, but ultimately you should rely on off-chain social governance um, and for the actual stakeholders in the community, not necessarily weighted by wealth, but weighted by like, maybe informally important to the community. Like, I think Ethereum's governance strategy is very good because it because of how informal and chaotic it is. Oh, I have to agree to this. Um, uh, it's, um, I think there's a, a use case for watching governance for things like DAOs where people want to delegate, like they want to manage some treasury and this treasury is, uh, um, uh, it kind of splits you, like you have to really need a majority of those who really decide to do it, but like not not at the meta level, like not changing the rules of the global uh, chain itself, for the reasons which uh, Stefan described. And also, uh, I think it's it's really beautiful what we have today with blockchains that are, that are forkable, uh, in that blockchains are uh, inherently anarchic and voluntary systems. Everyone who participates in blockchain does this because they, they believe that it's better for them to participate. No one, there's no version. If you don't like the rules of this chain, because of like the, so you don't like the, this particular branch or this particular community, you can always fork away to serve new rules or like, uh, not accept the change proposed by the majority. And you just see, and you have your own community, and, and then you participate there voluntarily. There's zero corruption anywhere. So in in, in a situation where like which Tetris has, where you can the majority can impose rules on everyone else. The, this beauty disappears. All of a sudden, it's a majority rule system, which is very different. But it, again, people are free to experiment with that, and they can always work, even if the majority doesn't like it. Right? So, like, but so, like, no one can prevent them. I can always fork Tezos and just build my own system, which, which functions in a different way. So, in a way, this like 51% uh, rule changing is just just a statement. It, it's just a narrative. It's, it's not like technically enforceable. Uh, so the, but like philosophically, I think it's, it's better to, to just uh, articulate it uh, out to you know, that is a system in which uh, coercion is not possible. I just want to briefly add um, to what Musa just said. There's, there's this middle ground where um, on-chain governance could very much look like in the Cosmos model, where you have like on-chain signaling posted. So there's, there's, it's not like in Tezos where uh, you vote and then it's get like on chain enforced or something like this, but um, instead you just vote with the token. And I don't, I, I'm actually a big fan of this. Um, but so for Celestia, um, we want the 
base layer to be as unopinionated and having as little execution as possible. So um, if, we, if we decided to go with the Ethereum model and not do any on-chain governance there, uh, the beauty of the system is that you could actually have like a, a, a governance uh, rollout where you can like uh, do the signaling on there. And you could actually even tie it to the token if you wanted to. So maybe via like IBC, like the blockchain communication protocol, which is also used in, in, like, in the Cosmos world, um, where you could, if you wanted to, you could tie the token of the rollout to the main chain. Um, um, and otherwise, you could still have like a, a governance rollout. So there's there's a lot of middle ground that could be could be used um, and needs to be explored. Awesome. Um... Yeah, so to switch directions a little, little bit um, back to what um, Mustafa briefly mentioned with Optimistic Walsh having this withdrawal like that's secreted. Um, he framed it as a positive in the scenario he described, but typically it seems a negative because you would want to have immediate um, withdrawal capabilities. Um, with bridges getting more mature and liquidity providers coming um, take distance, that seems to be less and less of an issue. Is that we would agree or disagree? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we disagree with that. But um, what I would, I would say is like, uh, yes, there's this one week withdrawal period, um, which is more ideal, but there's, work, there's ways to work around that, which is you have you can have liquidity providers. So let's say like you're on a roll-up chain and you want to transfer your assets to some other chain and spend it there, you don't necessarily have to wait a week. You don't necessarily have to wait a week. You can use a liquidity provider. And you see, like, the liquidity provider would have a, an account on both rollups or both chains. And you, you send the account on, um, you send your funds to the, the liquidity provider account on your the rollup that you want to withdraw from. And then they give you the assets on the rollup or the chain that you want to withdraw to. And uh, that's perfectly secure because the liquidity provider, instead of relying or waiting for fraud proofs, they can validate the rollup box for themselves. And they, when they validate the rollup box, they can be completely sure that it's impossible to generate a fraud proof for it. And therefore, they can be completely sure that it will definitely, possible, they will definitely get their funds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I disagree uh, because there are many situations where it, it won't work as smoothly, uh, in my opinion. Uh, for example, in times of volatility where the movement is strictly or like mostly unidirectional, so everyone wants to leave this chain and go on and sell some tokens. And then you, you quickly will drain out the capacity of the uh, liquidity providers and, and it will become just very expensive. Like you will have to pay a huge premium on, uh, on your exit. 10%, 50%, whatever. We actually saw this happening with Polygon. Certain, like on, on Black Thursday, there was a drop, a very significant drop in the price, and everyone rushed to exchange it. And, and like, the, the Ether on Polygon was traded significantly at a discount compared to the other one. Um, but there is also a coordination problem, and there is also a cost problem. So you need to keep this massive amount of capital idle. Parked for no good reason, just like that, that being for, for, for keeping that capacity. How much do you keep there? One million? One billion? You know, like, and then, then so you need to balance it, you need to like see exactly like what's the usage is, what's like, what's the daily fluctuation of this uh, exit volume and so on. I think it's going to be really hard and like, we'll, we'll just create a lot of cost. It will all be transformed into costs for the end users. Yeah, yeah. I definitely trade but, those, but, but the scenario describing is the same scenario that could, is a scenario where um, users cannot withdraw their funds quickly enough. But the same scenario can also happen in ZD Z- Z- Porter, for example, in the case of a malicious um, availability committee, which refuses to, to transfer funds. Yeah, but not on ZK Rollup. So ZK Porter has its own security problem. Like, if we compare uh, two rollups, so we should compare ZK Rollup to optimistic Rollup. Not optimistic role to the keyboard, we should compare it. Sure, and there's definitely trade offs. Um, so I'm not, uh, not going to claim, like, I, I believe in both you know, optimistic role and the trade offs between both. Like, I'm, not, uh, max, I'm not optimistic role of maximum max, or anything like that. But I, would, but I will also say that um, in the Celestia model, um, 
Because in Ethereum rollups, the fraud proofs are posted on chain, or to the Ethereum chain. But in the in the um, solution model, we envision a model where you can have sovereign rollups that are sort of like like chains in their own right. Um, and so the fraud proofs within don't need to be posted on chain, but can be distributed within the peer to peer network of that rollup sub network. And because you can distribute fraud proofs within the peer to peer network, you have a much, much lower challenge period um, within, that, within that network because there's a much lower network synchrony delay to distribute a fraud proof within a peer to peer network than, than there is to actually post it on chain and wait for a mine to accept that. Um, so that you can you can be like you can you reduce the challenge period like ten minutes or something. However, you still have the challenge period with with with, with cross chain bridges. Like if you actually um, translate your rollout from one from the rollout to another different, different chain, you still have this, you still have this one week in the ritual, ritual period. So there's definitely trade offs. Actually, other question for you: Do you use um, IBC like for for like if you if you submit the fraud proof? Including, uh, in, like, let's say the the fraud proof is gossiped in the P2P network of the one one chain, and um, you want to notify the other chain when you submit it, um, like the IBC. Or is it, is it? It's not. It's not. Doesn't help because it's itself a bridge. What's the question about? So, so if you can submit, if you can submit um, the fraud proof that is gossiped in the P2P layer of the of one chain. And submit it via IDC to like to the other chain, but use leverage IDC to like submit the fraud proof somewhere that is like available to you and doesn't work instead of like waiting. Uh, yeah, but yeah, but sure, but you still have this issue where you have to wait for the rollout be with the, the block, right? So, yeah. And it's yeah. wait, waiting for it is the fact that you have to wait for it to be within for a block that you cannot you cannot make it you cannot Assume that the challenge period will be too low because uh, like you don't know how much one chain capacity there is. Like maybe the chains are really busy, and like maybe miners in that chain are a bit are a bit malicious and you'll be able to do something like that. And um, so you can make uh, it's easy. To, you can make more. You can make less assumptions. You can easily make more assumptions about the page, about the page network that you control than the, the, the chain. Yeah, so the follow-up question I want to ask um, that um, is relevant to withdrawals or the liquidity providers between rollups. Um, are there any specific advantages that ZK rollups have over optimistic or vice versa that deal specifically with non-functional assets because we're seeing that these become more popular through in-game assets or otherwise? Perhaps on this one, we don't have a good answer for that. Um, yeah, I mean, Optimistic and um, zero ops. 
Like, it, it probably doesn't make sense to do it on ZK Roblox because it's not a complicated application. It's just like a transfer of assets. And ZK Roblox right now are well suited towards like simple transfer of assets. And uh, they're not very well suited right now to like more complicated like applications that have more complicated logic. And um, long term, that might be solved. And um, I know some people are trying to work on like more general like purpose. Um, Having general purpose computation in terms of ZK Rollups. But it's not, it, it's, it's not clear to me like how, what time I'm looking at and, and, and how practical it will be in the future. Um, I have a quick question. You mentioned that the ZK Porter and the uh, ZK Rollup accounts, they are interoperable. Does, does that, when you say they're interoperable, do you mean exactly what you just said, that you can easily? Like transfer from one account to the other, and it's so, so it's always an either or. Um, so the, the, you just like within the system, they are uh, indistinguishable essentially. The, the only difference is like outside on the validator level, who will publish or not publish the data, which is externally observable by the uh, uh, by the users. But inside the system, there is no distinction. You just have one address, the other address. Some of it's there, some of some, some the bounce is there. So like, it, it's fully, it's seamless, it's just like that one. Okay, let's see, thank you. So, in a role-centric world, um, I know that you said you think that there's going to be one instance of ZK sync, but in the celestial world, there's going to be multiple rollups, right? Um, so you can consider both scenarios. Um, in a scenario where there are multiple rollups, how did you envision um, multiple apps being on one rollup or one rollup specific, or one app specific chain um, affecting immediate interoperability? Um, yes, I think your argument is that you're going to need, like, yeah, it's less you have multiple rollups, both for scalability reasons and for um, flexibility reasons. The scalability reasons because, um, like, you you don't want to like it's not scalable to have like a massive uh, like one roll up doing all the execution because you need to um, have an aggregator with a lot of resources to you know to to, to um, produce that chain and also you have and, to, and also you have to have fraud proof generators that have a lot of resources uh, and ZK roll up have the same issue because you still need to actually, you still need the ZK prover to process all those transactions. But you don't have the verification issue because it's constant verification cost. And that's the first reason. And then the second reason is uh, flexibility. We want people to have to, to have the flexibility of creating um, their own, like creating different execution environments. Like you don't want to have like one roll up. That's just an EVM roll up. I mean, you could, like someone can create it. Someone can definitely click on the share. Um, but like we don't want to. We don't want to tie to that model. We want people we want be, to, to, to be able to have people create their own execution environments to be able to innovate um, in different ways. Um, but uh, I'll leave you here. My understanding is like with ZK, with ZK Sync, it's like you're only targeting, if you're only targeting one application, which is, which is payments, there's not much need to have flexibility in different execution environments because like, pay, like there's only one way to do payments. There's not that much flexibility. Like, if you it's, 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 it's the application is an asset transfer, there's not much need to have different execution environments for that. Yeah, this is true, but then you normally don't just want to have the transfers, you want to do transfers within, you want to remain within the ecosystem. So think from the user perspective. You have one wallet, you have some, some, some balance in it, you want, sometimes you want to send a transaction to you know, send some money to a friend or pay for something online. But then you know, also want to participate in DeFi from the same account, you know what I mean? Yeah, but like why? It's like why, like, why if you want to say it's why you want to participate in DeFi? Like are you saying like you should like embed a bunch of DeFi protocols into this into your ZK role? Well uh, we, we're gonna build a generic robot where you can deploy anything, right? So like people can deploy smart contracts or like it's custom. Yeah, yeah, so like, like, people can deploy smart contracts, of course. Like if, if any email smart contracts they can transfer things, but they can also invoke contracts and they can program what they can contract. And the more interesting question is like do they want to experiment with the uh, different execution environments, EVM or non-EVM compatible. 
And uh, this is a really big question, and uh, it, it's not the best language, it's not the best API, but it's, it, it gets sticky. It's actually terrible in many ways, but it gets sticky, and now it's, it's, it's the standard. And there is no question, like, no, no one is coming with browsers uh, uh, that support alternative APIs. And very much supports JavaScript and, and DOM and uh, standard HTML uh, things, right? So I'm afraid we're at this point with EBM. At least for the observable future, it will be this. Like, there is no like, EBM compatibility will be this lingua franca of blockchains. That, that's why we, we're on it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very strongly believe that there's like the necessity to like innovate and experiment with different things, especially like MDB, for instance, mentioned. You cannot come up with a perfect solution in all cases. And it's, uh, the beauty like in Celestia is that you can like um, have different, literally have different rollups that deal differently with this. And also, um, you mentioned JavaScript is a very good analogy, but like, I, I'm very happy that although JavaScript may be like in the browser, the default, okay, um, there's like a bunch of other languages that we as developers can use, and I'm very happy about this fact. And I think also, um, we already live in a world where people build like, in different languages, not only uh, using the EVM, and also in, in, in using the Optimist Roller pattern, you can still have an EVM compatible execution environment on top of, for instance, Celestia. And so there's, there's, no, there's no limit. Like, it's, it's why would we limit ourselves to just JavaScript in quotes, like even if, uh, also I think it's, it's, we're still, I still believe it's quite early in, in the logic space and also the innovation service, and like the, 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 yeah, the innovation happens much faster than in the browser world, so even if JavaScript in quotes might be the standard now, like six years from now the world will be completely different and um, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, so it's, it's also not just about language, it's also about resource pricing. Um, so it's like, with JavaScript, I think it's a bit different because uh, like, people have created all, all kinds of things to make JavaScript more palatable, like, you know, jQuery, jQuery, and like, languages that compile, you can compile C to JavaScript, like, there's all these, like, like, stuff on top of it, like, the JS and the CoffeeScript to make it more palatable. Um, but that's, that works in the JavaScript case because, um, JavaScript runs locally, like, well, like, JavaScript doesn't, doesn't run on a global shared machine. So you can do all these, like, abstractions that, that, that can be done on local machines or within the browser, but it's much more difficult to do that on a world computer like Ethereum. And, um, like, I implemented, like, elliptic, like, I implemented, like, elliptic, um, elliptic kind of crypto libraries, and like, the, got the gas cost is 2 billion gas, for example. Um, and there's no way for me to optimize that, um, like without convincing, like like the Ethereum community to do it, to do a lot of work to introduce a new upgrade. Um, so it's much more that like, there's a lot of like stuff you have to do to introduce to, if you want to optimize it. Like people have optimized JavaScript a lot on the browser level, um, but if you want to do that on Ethereum, with like, specific things that are more expensive, if you do it on Ethereum, you have to do a lot of work to introduce new upgrades to do that. Just to make it like, but even the, just to make it performant. Cool. Um, I'm going to ask one last question to the audience, um, which is, what is your long-term vision for the crypto industry as a whole, uh, and how do you envision Celestia? Who do you think uh, playing to that, specifically with respect to privacy, transparency, and user adoption? I'll start with you guys. Sure, so like, is it, is it a mission-driven project? The mission is to bring crypto to the hands of everyone in the world. Uh, it's just a question of how. It's not, like, it's not a question of like, whether or not it will happen. It will happen. It's like, we have to figure out how to do it exactly. So we will start with what we have now. It will bring us to some uh, multiple uh, of the users potentially possible in Ethereum today. So it will probably bring us to like millions, um, like hundreds of millions of users. Not billions yet, but eventually we will we'll have to get to billions. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the, I just 
can't see a world where this is not happening for a variety of reasons, for like from, from a social uh, perspective. Like, like there's a huge demand for this. There's a demand, uh, like, this is a problem many people have and don't know they have. Uh, and there will be more events in the traditional finance world that will push people towards this development, and will make them embrace this um, uh, uh, technology more. Uh, and, and also the young generation, like the Gen Zers, are uh, just like, very uh, token and crypto native. Like, they're not just internet native, they're already like, token native. Right? So, like, generational shifts from now, uh, the majority of people in the world will be just like, naked exposed to that. So it's, uh, it's just inevitable. Yeah, so I think like, our, our, our like, ultimate vision is that we see a potential world where every community, like, from small communities like, you know, like gaming, like some private gaming center on Minecraft, to large communities like governments, they will all potentially have their own kind of value system or, 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 applica or a centralized application on a chain to either track for either governance purposes or value transfer purposes or um, or just to record information to make it more transparent. Um, I, I see a potential world where every community has its own kind of like state on some kind of chain um, or on the internet um, to keep track of either value or, or governance. And it's just going to be impossible, like, to have every community have a, having a shared state on a, on a shared experience environment. And um, but if you make it possible for for communities to easily deploy your own software chains um, within seconds, then I think if you make it that frictionless, it will it will eventually happen. And um, the only kind of question there is, like, from a technical perspective, is it it how do you, how do you make those different chains associated communities interoperable and composable? Because right now, if you create a smart contract in Ethereum, you can easily call all smart contracts in Ethereum and do stuff like, and communicate with all smart contracts. But in a world where everything is a roll up, and inter interoperability and composability between those roll ups and communities becomes a little bit more trickier. And I think that's, but unfortunately, I think. Uh, we have to deal with that because that's what's already, what's already happening today. Is like for the past ten years, blockchain developers have basically gotten a free lunch uh, with composability. Like they've, they haven't had to think about composability of it. It's like just deploy a smart contract in Ethereum and just call the you know, call on smart contracts very easily. But even with Ethereum in the future, like with Ethereum two point zero, that's, that's no longer going to be the case. Like you have to have this roll up centric roadmap. roadmap where people were expected to create their own role for their own applications. Um, and so you just have to accept the fact that developers will have to bake, think more carefully or bake in interoperability direct, explicitly into their applications. And technologies like you know, Cosmos and IBC will be very important with, for that, part of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much aligned with like what um, Mustafa's vision is. I, I, I'm just adding. I just want to add that I think it's not the like mass adoption and these global communities and that interoperate with each other is not just something we want to push or is like nice to have from a technical perspective or is like because people are already crypto native or whatever. But I believe that um, eventually, like something like some form of like global coordination across communities is also like a necessity for, for uh, us like as a, as a global society. All right, thanks for your answers. And we can open up to the floor. Any questions? If you have any. That's the question to Alex. Uh, I should have answered it before, but uh, it's related to ZK Sync and ZK Porter. So, do ZK Sync and uh, ZK Porter support inter contract like, communication on EVM? So, can you, uh, using ZK Porter and ZK Sync, like, um, share state between contracts on EVM? Inside ZK Sync? Uh, no, using ZK Sync, like, using those relapse. So, 
Um, so like you said that ZK Sync and ZK Porter is EVM compatible with ZK Lock. So uh, like and it runs EVM at some point and pulls uh, the results on chain, like on layer one. So is it possible for to do like roll up level in your contract? Like, so you like deploy one contract and other contract, and can they uh, interact with each other? Inside the scene. Inside the scene. Well, this is a great question. Thank you so much for it. That means like I, I, I still didn't do a good job in explaining that in the presentation. Like I, I was trying, doing my best, but like I need to find a good wording. So like, this is what we meant when we say they are seamlessly interoperable and composable. So like essentially, like everything is inside the scene. You can think of it as a it, it's, it's, as a model of Ethereum. So it, the answer is clear: yes, you can deploy multiple contracts. They can call each other. These calls can be atomic. Uh, they will execute, share the state, access each other's variables, do delegate call, do normal call, and everything works just exactly the same as layer one. Does, does this answer your question? Yeah. So we, we need so to there is no there is no limitation to EVM. Like if you run them on, on uh, there is no contract limitation on the rollup level. Well, there, there will be some limitations. Like you probably cannot do like one million calls in the same block. Like there will be some soft limitations based on on hard limitation with a very high uh, degree of like how many how, how deep is your recursion stack can be? How many contracts can be? In the, uh, sorry, how many calls can there be? In, uh, in a single transaction, in a block, and so on, but th there will be like some technical nature of the proof generation. Although we have recursive proof generations, so we theoretically can go like, unlimited. We, we just think, but th there will be some nuances there. But from from practical standpoint, it won't affect like most people. So like, the limits are very far, very high. So you can do that. Okay, thanks. I actually have a follow-up question to that. Like, what if um, you hit capacity in that EVM and you deploy another such like another instance of that roller? Like, how will they end up? Yeah, because there's, there's like one way that it's right to how much symbols you can proof and verify on the on the other. Yeah, there is no limit how much symbols you can can verify because it's like perfectly recursive. So we can put as many um, it's like we have mini blocks, uh, and we can chain as many of them in a single big row block as we need. So there is no limit there. You can split it up into multiple machines. You don't need to split it up into multiple machines. We do it on parallel. Like oh, and we, we, we just like have a big, powerful sequential processor, which takes transactions and then puts them in the block, and then it, the block, like this big row block, as long as you need. I mean, there's, there's like if there's, if you think there's a limit to how um, what the most powerful processor is. Like, let's say you get a core on main web, there's still a there's still a limit to how much that processor is like. So, so I guess the question is like, can you parallelize the the, 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 the proving of the video up into multiple like cores? Uh, sure. So when we, this is a limitation all the VM compatible uh, systems share. Because the VM is inherently special, and there have been proposals by Vitalik uh, Viterian, for example, to add a, an overlay on top of EVM transactions to make trans parallel transaction processing possible, where you specify in some non Turing complete language which accounts are going to be touched by this transaction, and then you can build a tree of dependencies and then you can execute the sub paths and the streams you know, in par parallel. Um, and this can be added, and th this will probably happen in the future. Like the, the, this is a pretty far future. Because for now, the bottleneck of EVM uh, compatible chains, like essentially GAF and everything which is based on GAF, is not the, the CPU, it's not the bandwidth, it's the uh, random storage access. Uh, and this can be easily so like this. This can be easily boosted manifold if you just store all of your storage in the RAM, in, 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 in memory. Sure. You disagree? But uh, the, the, what this will give you is requirements for running the processor node will be very high, which is okay for ZK rollups, 
which is not okay for optimistic rollups. So for, for, for ZK rollups, it's perfectly fine. Yes, we have high requirements for running a node. You have to run it in a, in a very powerful machine with lots of CPUs and lots of memories. Uh, and you cannot do anything wrong anyway because you, you, like, you will produce the, the proof and you will share this proof with everyone. Would, would it, like, it will be reflected here. But I agree, this won't work for optimistic rollups because everyone should be able to run a full node on their consumer hardware and then you, you cannot have this limitation. So, 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 so this idea of multiple recursive um, ZK proofs inside a single uh, kind of ZK rollup, you have multiple recursive ZK rollups inside a multiple ZK rollup. It's like, so you have multiple recursive rollups in a single rollup, and that allows you to parallelize the execution of that rollup, assuming that EVM can be parallelized. You could do that if you wanted, you could build a hierarchy of uh, chains where you like essentially shards, where you execution each of the shards and then you aggregate it recursively. This is possible. We just cracked CD in the original CD port and post. Um, but uh, and, and this will probably indeed happen. So it's some some of the um, application specific, community specific uh, uh, systems will, will, will be like this, like games. They will have their own shard, and they, 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 most transactions happen within the shard. They only need to propagate up to the uh, upper levels, like, uh, to, to the easy, easy girl itself, when you want to move funds out or in, to the shard. But most things happen inside it. No one else will need to know except for the proof of the block. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, on ZK sync, relative to Ethereum, is could like uh, could the validator or the aggregator do MEV worse or less? More MEV or less MEV? Yeah. So ZK the all rollups are like pretty equal in this regard. If you don't address the MEV problem specifically, then you're down to your sequencer, like whatever MEV uh, minor extraction the sequencer allows. That's what you have. If you have a centralized sequencer, they can do whatever they want. You can form a box in any way and give it to transactions, they will do what they want. And it's a question of how you deal with this. If you have a decentralized sequencer, it's a question of how you structure it. Right? So I can, and in generally, what's your philosophical position on MEV? So for the case, I can say that we, we believe that MEV is evil because it puts uh, a certain group of users in a much more privileged position than the, the, everyone else. And this is what blockchains are uh, against. Right? So you want you want to have equal rules. So imagine Ethereum miners, the mining pool operator has a lot more power than uh, than the um, whoever provides the, uh, the mining shares. Like they can do it in a secretive manner so that no one notices immediately, and they get all the profit to themselves. Right? And they, they don't share it with with the um, mining hash like, with with actual miners. And the miners cannot hold them accountable, unlike just distributing rewards. So, for the case, as long as uh, there is a signal sequencer which is centralized, uh, uh, this, the operator just guarantees that there will be no enemy. Like transactions are going to be uh, served on first come, first, first serve order. Uh, with a decentralized sequencer, we'll have small, uh, uh, low latency blocks like within a second. Uh, so this will lower the window of opportunity to reorder transactions because you need to provide the confirmation as soon as possible. And in the long run, we'll have something like uh, uh, time locked encryption to prevent censorship and MEV altogether fundamentally. Because the, the, the miners won't even know what they're signing, what, what's going on the block until it's uh, time What's your No, I was wondering how you're doing your time, and uh, another question. Yeah, you have one more question left. Uh, I actually have a question. No, okay. Can we do two questions, please? Sure. I'll make it quick. It's a promise. I'll try to. I have a question. You mentioned automated bug bounty, what you're referring to. And the second question, what's your plan with Hadamard? Like 
first question is about what, it, what do you mean by automated, automatic bug bounty? And second question, you mentioned about the plan with honeypots. What are you going to do? Be specific. So like, I, I, automated bug bounty is just a convert which has some money in it. And if you crack it, you get it. So like, this is, or you, you, could, you could do like more stuff. Like if you, if you find a vulnerability in this contract then, and you can prove that there is a vulnerability in some way, like for example, you can destroy it, not just steal the funds from it, but if you feel like if you have a separate contract which points to this one, and it will release the, the bounty to whoever can prove that they destroyed this contract, they executed the transaction that, that led to destruction. Uh, this would be maybe something like this. Like this, this will provide you more um, certain. Like if, for you as a as an exploiter or white hat hacker, like who hacks around, do be very guaranteed uh, rather than rely on reputation and trust in project owners who might or might not give you the bond. So that this, that, that's what they call high bonds for the time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll move quickly. Um, it's it's mostly to do with ZK Sync, but I guess also like philosophically between what rollups were and sort of where they're going, there seems to be a lack of discernibility in something that ZK Sync does, in that it provides. You can kind of say group is arbitrary or occasional. You can say it's um, well, you have this validation of, of state transitions for for any given proof in in ZK EVM compatible versus like. And what we say earlier stuff like ZK money being kind of limited on what they can do, and I think a lot of people mismatch between normal recursion or normal rollups and then arbitrary recursion first, whether it's state transitions or Cairo do with the defining the CPU in the circuit. Do you think more discernible language ought to be provided so people kind of know where it was and then what the future may be? So, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Can you, can so do you think more discernible language must be given so people understand the difference between like validating a state transition for any gold up proof or, or any prejudice going in in what ZK Sync 2.0 does or in what Cairo does versus non ZK EVM in this case compatible roll ups like, like previous things like ZK Money and stuff? So you, you're, you're just saying like whether we should provide a more strict, rigorous language to distinguish between different types of uh, uh, of. Uh, I guess recursion methods on projects because people seem to batch together companies like Loopring and, and Mina and Aztec with sort of the type of things going on now, and they are quite different in what they are planned to and what they provide. I mean, of course, like the inner workings are different, like Stark is completely different, but. What they actually plan on doing and what they provide really is quite different, and they seem to be brought together or stuck together, and that doesn't seem to, to mold quite well. Oh, I see. So, well, you, you have a hierarchy of, uh, of classification of systems, right? So, like, you have L2s and non L2s, and L2s are subsequently categorized as like roll ups and uh, non roll ups, and roll ups can be ZK and, 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 and optimistic, and ZK roll ups can be. Based on Starks, based on Starks. Starks can be with terms of setup and not. So, like, if you want to dig deeper, you you need to understand this. Like, it it, it, it won't help to just like use more specific language. You, you really need to have these models in your head or before your eyes. And like, th there are these these classifications and these crowds which like categorize systems. Like, what is Validium? What is uh, what is Rollup? What is ZK Core? So, uh, I think like. It, not many people will understand, and those who will understand, they actually have to dive deeper and then go into nuances. Well, All right, uh, let's have one last round of applause for all our panelists. Cool. All right. Thanks again for coming.